You know what that sound means. It's time for the Michigan DNR's Wild Talk Podcast. Welcome to the Wild Talk Podcast, where representatives from the DNR's Wildlife Division chew the fat and shoot the scat about all things habitat, feathers, and fur. With insights, interviews, and your questions answered on the air, you'll get a better picture of what's happening in the world of wildlife here in the great state of Michigan. Welcome to Wild Talk. I'm your host, Rachel Leitner, and here with me today is the fabulous Hannah Shower. And we have an excellent show here today. Uh, we'll be joined by Cody Norton, our large carnivore specialist, to talk about black bear management in Michigan. Later in the show, we'll answer some of your questions from the mailbag. And of course, sometime during the episode, we will also be revealing the winners of our Wild Talk podcast mugs, and you can find out how you can win one too. We'll also be chatting with Mark Sargent to hear about the happenings in the Southwest region. But before we get into those updates, let's start things off by shining our wildlife spotlight on the fox squirrel. Fox squirrels. They're foxy and they're squirrely. Yes, they absolutely are. <laughs> You've probably seen these fox squirrels running around your yard this time of year. The eastern fox squirrel found throughout most of Michigan has an orange colored underside with a gray brown coloration on its back. But there can be a lot of variation in individual coloration. And we've gotten some interesting photos of unusually colored squirrels. I've seen some blonde squirrels, some dark colored squirrels, squirrels with a typical body coloration and an all white tail, squirrels with white patches fur, you name it. There have been all kinds. Um, so very interesting, a lot of variation, but makes them unique. It does. I actually have a fox squirrel that's in my yard and its underbelly is totally black um, while the top is still like the same brownish coloration. And it, for a while, I thought it was a weasel because it appeared to be very long and slender, but the black was just kind of casting a shade. So they're very unusual colorations. So the fox squirrel is the largest tree squirrel in Michigan and the only member of the squirrel family that is larger than the woodchuck. Fox squirrels can be found in deciduous wooded areas with open understory and often in rural and urban areas too. Yeah, and fox squirrels are generally active throughout most of the day and are usually solitary. Um, except this time of year, you might see them frolicking with other squirrels. Uh, but And because they're active during the day, you're very likely to see them when they're out and about. Home range for a fox squirrel might get up to five to 10 acres in size, but in more rural areas, you're likely to see those home ranges overlap. And in urban areas, the home ranges will be smaller. Now they'll nest in deciduous tree cavities, or if a cavity is not available, they'll build a nest of leaves and twigs. Lots of squirrel squabbles happen this time of year, especially while looking for food. Uh, so fox squirrels dine on buds, flowers, fruits, and might also eat the occasional insect, egg, or young bird. Uh, during the late summer months, squirrels start hiding acorns and nuts uh, by burying them in the ground. And they'll rely on those stashes of food during the cold winter months when other foods aren't available. They can also relocate those food stores with great success using an excellent sense of smell and a good memory. I wish I had the memory of a squirrel some days. And I can find whatever I lost. Certainly would be helpful. I also would like it to be acceptable to just bury caches of snacks wherever I want them to be so that I can go back to them later yes. on the couch is, cushions or things like that. This is an excellent plan. We should start this. Young squirrels are typically born uh, in March or April, and some older females can have a second litter again in July. The average litter size is three to four young, and they are born naked and blind. They won't start getting solid food until about 10 weeks after they are born, and they're independent around 13 weeks. Now, if you've got squirrels hanging around, you've probably also seen some predators. Some common predators of squirrels include hawks, foxes, coyotes, weasels, and humans. Mast or nut productions in the previous year can impact squirrel survival over the winter months. And in rural and urban areas, car mortality is often seen. All right, so don't scurry off. Next up, we'll be talking with Mark Sargent. Pure Michigan hunt applications are on sale now. If you want your shot of what is considered Michigan's ultimate hunt, pick up a $5 application or two. There's no limit to the number you can buy. 
If you're one of the three lucky winners, you'll get a hunting prize package worth thousands, as well as licenses for elk, bear, spring and fall turkey, antlerless deer, and first pick at a managed waterfowl area for a reserved hunt. Purchase anywhere hunting licenses are sold or online at michigan.gov pmh. Welcome back to Wild Talk. Mark Sargent, the Southwest Regional Manager, is here today to chat with us about the happenings in the Southwest region. Thanks for joining us today, Mark. Thanks, Breakdown Hannah. It's great being with you today. So let's kick off with talking about accomplishments. Uh, what would you say is the biggest accomplishment that the Southwest region has tackled this quarter? You know, you used to think as winter time was being a slow time, and now we don't have a slow time. So our staff has been super busy with a lot of things. First of January, we wrapped up our season of collecting deer samples. So just last week, we ended the goose hunting at the Allegan Todd Farm in Allegan County. That area is matched specifically for waterfowl hunting and more targeted to goose hunting. And we do that by planting agricultural crops such as corn and rye and winter wheat to attract and hold geese. We also have a large refuge area that it provides a food resource for migratory waterfowl as they move through Southern Michigan. At Allegan, it's all dry land hunting, so having a boat or a canoe is not necessary. Uh, we allow you to drive out to your blind and unload your decoys and you can carry them in from there. So it's really accessible and we have a real long history of providing that um, opportunity to Michigan waterfowl hunters. Sounds like some really uh, awesome and unique uh, waterfowl and birding uh, experiences out there. Thanks for sharing all that. It sounds like a really cool place to check out. So uh, what would you say the biggest project is that you have kind of looming on the horizon for the Southwest region? So one project that we it, we actually started the, the, the partnership five years ago, but we're right now really starting to see the implementation is the work that we're doing at Gordex State Game Area over near Portage. Next biggest town would be Kalamazoo, which is right next door. That property is about 2,300 acres, and we began land acquisition in 1941. And I don't think we knew at that time what would, what would be the future, but right now that property of 2,300 acres is completely surrounded by the city of uh, Portage. And we've decided that this property has a different opportunity. So we started working with the city of Portage and we have developed a memorandum of agreement with them to manage that in partnership and in collaboration as an urban wildlife area. I think that's the first one in the state. So we're pretty proud of that. That sounds awesome. Uh, all this Gordon X State Game Area stuff is really innovative and super exciting to see roll out. So thanks for highlighting some of those things, Mark. Now, you're the supervisor for the Southwest region, and you've got a lot of tremendous hardworking staff in throughout the region. Um, if within the last quarter, have there been any impressive contributions from some of your staff? I've got one of the best jobs in the TNR. And that's because I work for some of the best staff in the wildlife division, and they step it up every day. But in the last three to six months, and then really over the last two years of the pandemic, they have stepped it up every day. Um, they continue to work with the restrictions that we have and drive every day to get product on the ground, to get natural resources managed, to get habitat work done, and to provide uh, great recreational opportunities to our stakeholders. Um, I'll just give you an example. So we talked about CWD and there was long days and long hours. There was weekend work. They got her done. Thank you so much, Mark, for um, taking the time to share uh, some of the work that's being done in the Southwest region. We, Like I said, we really appreciate you carving out a few minutes to share that with us and our listeners. So next up, everybody, stick around. We'll be talking with Cody Norton about black bear management in Michigan. There are many camping and lodging opportunities available in Michigan state parks. 
When you choose State Park Campgrounds, you get more than just a campsite. State Parks offer a diverse range of recreational opportunities including hands-on instructional classes, nature programs, places to fish, boat launches, family-friendly events, and much more. Reservations can be made six months in advance, so why wait? Visit MIDNRreservations.com or call 1-800-44-PARKS to make a reservation. Wild Talk. Joining Rachel and I today to talk about black bears is Cody Norton, the Wildlife Division's large carnivore specialist. Welcome to the show, Cody. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you on the show. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your role with the division and how you got interested in black bears? Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm the large carnivore specialist. So I'm responsible for bear, wolf, and cougar management in the state for the wildlife division. So I get to work with kind of the, the big toothy animals and and spend a lot of time on them. I guess I've I've always had an interest in uh, in bears in particular. Um, I actually did my master's research on black bears in here in the Upper Peninsula, looking at how they respond to timber harvest and then also infanticide risk, which is actually when uh, a male bear might try to kill unrelated offspring to bring a female into estrus and to breed sooner. So I've, I've been working with bears for quite a while now, and uh, they're kind of my my favorite. That sounds like some interesting research to be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. And that was part of the Michigan Predator Prey Study, um, which was a great project working with bears, wolves, coyotes, bobcat, and deer. Gave me a great, you know, kind of insight into what working with those carnivores in the future would be. We brought you on because we've heard that the, the Michigan Bear Management Plan is currently being updated, and we, we kind of want to dig into what some of those updates are. But first, can you tell us a little bit more about what the Bear Management Plan is? Sure. So the, the management plan is basically a document that outlines our strategic guidance for managing bears in Michigan. So it doesn't get into all the nitty-gritty details of what we're going to do with bears, but it kind of provides that, you know, long-term vision for how we want to move forward and and manage bears um, throughout the state in the upper end and northern lower peninsulas. So um, would you be willing to touch on some of the updates to the plan? Like what sort of items have been most recently updated? I know the plan gets reviewed every so often. but Yeah, so we, we strive to update the plan every 10 or so years. Um, it was originally written in 2009, so we're you know, in the process of doing the update now, we we feel that we have a really solid foundation to the plan. We haven't really seen, you know, big changes or don't anticipate big changes with this update. We're really, we're updating it. We're not doing a complete rewrite of the management plan. Um, so for the most part, it's been trying to include, you know, the latest information from within the state on bears, like new population estimates, um, new hunting regulations or bear management units. Um, any changes like that. You know, we've been getting information from the public, getting input from the public on if we should be changing, you know, wording or reorganizing, combining, moving around our goals, strategies, and objectives within the plan. So honestly, it's been mostly, um, you know, updating information and then minor changes to those big picture items. Um, so you mentioned getting input, like public input on the plan. Can you go over that process a little bit for us? Yeah, definitely. We we kind of kicked off the update process. And actually, before I was in this position, um, it got kicked off with pretty much a month-long public comment period where the public could you know, provide comments, kind of review what our the 2009 plan is, the current plan that's in place. And then we also met with our Bear Forum, which is a group that's made up of different stakeholders that are you know, interested or vested in bear management in the state. And we also reached out to the tribal governments as well within Michigan. So we basically, you know, are trying to get input from all of those different viewpoints and consult with the tribes. And then once we had a, a draft management plan put together based on that input and, and new things that have happened with estimates and, and regulations, then we put that draft updated plan out to the public, the forum and tribes once again. Awesome. So lots of opportunity for input on bear management in Michigan. Um, so when can folks expect to, to see that final draft or the whole final plan? The plan still has to go before the Natural Resources Commission and the director of the department um, and the director has to sign off on it. So we expect that to be happening this spring. That's awesome. 
And so once that is finalized, um, just so our listeners know, that will go on our BEAR website. So it'll be at michigan.gov forward slash BEAR. So later in the year, if you're interested in finding a, a final BEAR management plan, you can find it on that website. We have a bear hunting season here in Michigan that typically runs from September to October. Uh, can you give us some season recaps of how the 2021 season went? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, bear hunting is our, you know, major tool for changing bear abundance throughout the state. So it's, it's a really important management tool for us. There's a lot of folks that participate in bear hunting across the state. This past season, we harvested about 1,300 bears in the Upper Peninsula and about 500 bears in the northern lower peninsula. In general, it was a, a pretty solid year. Uh, most of our UP bear management units, so we actually break both regions up into management units so that we can kind of control where that harvest occurs and spread out hunters. But in most of the UP units, we actually had above average hunter success. So they were, they were being successful at finding bears, at harvesting bears. I think a lot of that came down to decent mass production years, good Pretty good bear food sources out there. The weather cooperated pretty well, especially early in the season for hunters. You know, not too much hot weather, not too much rain or wind. And so we saw good success. Uh, the northern lower was very similar. We typically, you know, always in recent years have had really good success rates in the northern lower. And so we, we kind of continued to see that. And I think the food resources and the habit or the weather conditions were, were pretty similar to the UP as well. Um, out of curiosity, how do people find bears? Is there a particular a habitat that bears live in or signs that you look for? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, they are generalists, so they key into all sorts of different habitat types depending on the time of year. So really, I think it, it really comes down to finding where the food is for bears at that time of year when you're trying to pursue them. So once you're getting into September and October, they're typically switching over to those hard mass sources, especially, you know, oak, acorns, um, you know, variation in, in hard mass food sources in the northern lower with walnuts and, and chestnuts, hazelnuts, um, trying to key into those food sources that are available during that time of year. Um, also, black cherry can be a really good good food source. It's a soft mass food source that's, that's around later in the year. So trying to key into areas near oak stands, near hardwood stands that have cherry, but also Big swamps are always good for keeping a, a large, dark-colored animal cool um, if there's warmer temps and, and just trying to stay away from, you know, places with a lot of people. They generally need big tracts of land and, and water waterways are always good ways for them to be moving around and not be seen too. So you kind of try to piece everything together and, and find those hot spots for bear activity. Um, do you know what the biggest bear that was harvested this year was? I have... I heard about a bear um, from the northern lower that was harvested that the live weight they were estimating was 650 pounds. Um, and it was actually taken by a, a young, I think, 14 year old uh, girl down there. So pretty cool story. I didn't get to I haven't seen any pictures of the bear yet, but it sounded like a, like a really neat, neat opportunity. And that's about as big as bears get <laughs> in Michigan. Honestly, when you see bears come through a, you know, come through the check station or, or see them out in the field, I'd say, I mean, a 250 pound bear looks looks like a, a pretty nice, solid, you know, mature bear. And when they start packing on weight from there up, you know, 350, 450, um, you're getting into some some pretty special bears, I think. And yeah, into the 650 pound range, that is a, a giant bear for Michigan. That must have been a really thrilling experience for that hunter. Wow. Do you have the ages of the bears that, that were harvested this year? I don't, but I did do a little bit of digging for last year, you know, kind of looking at the ages that we saw. And I think the oldest one we had last year was 25 years old. Um, that was harvested in the Eastern UP in the Newberry Bear Management Unit, which is a pretty old bear. I think the oldest we've ever seen, um, at least since 1989, where we kind of were started pulling teeth was 30 years old. So when people are hunting bears, I think they typically don't think about them, you know, as, as getting quite a bit older than most of the game species that we hunt and pursue in Michigan. Um, you know, you compare that to deer or small game or anything like that. Turkeys, um, it's just on a completely different level, typically. Pretty much every year we're getting bears in the 20 plus year old range coming in. You know, I know a lot of hunters enjoy bear meat, um, so eating the bear that they've harvested, 
Are there any other uses that hunters usually use bears for after they've had a successful harvest? Yeah, definitely. And the the meat's pretty interesting. It it uh, has a lot higher, you know, kind of higher fat content and marbling. You can actually see in some of it. So it it tastes a little different than a deer. It doesn't dry out quite as much as you know deer and other wild game typically does. That's leaner. Um, so that makes it really really fun to cook with. You can kind of use it for maybe a wider variety of things, or you don't have to mix in pork or some other you know domestic livestock. One of the other really cool things about bears is that you can render the fat. And so if you actually collect the fat, you know, without the meat and basically simmer it for a long time, you can pull out bear grease or bear oil, it's called. And that has a ton of uses. It actually used to be really common um, back during like European settlement and, you know, hundreds of years ago. But now, you know, it, it can still be used for, you know, a cooking oil. Basically, it can replace olive oil, vegetable oil, anything else that you might want to, you know, cook with or fry in. You can use it for for baking as well, like in pie crust and cookies. People use it for conditioning leather, making sure it doesn't dry out and crack. Um, you can use it kind of as gun oil and lubrication. Um, you can use it as, a, you know, a fuel source and oil lamps. You can actually burn it to create, you know, light. So it's a very versatile substance that you can make from bears that you typically isn't something you can get from wild game. So very, very unique to, to them. Uh, and any other interesting tidbits that have happened within the last couple of seasons? Yeah. Um, one really cool thing that showed up last year twice is we actually had two color phase bears get harvested in the far western UP. But both of those bears were, were what we call cinnamon uh, colored. I mean, just a beautiful coat color, something that we typically do not see very often in Michigan at all. Um, I've talked to some of the, you know, DNR staff over in the West End, the West UP, um, and they they said that they might see a color phase bear once every five to 10 years. Never heard of a color phase bear coming from anywhere else in the state. It's kind of a unique thing that we're, we only see there. Uh, started talking with some of our research partners on the UP deer movement study that's been going on up here. And they've actually gotten trail camera photos of cinnamon, chocolate, and blonde bears all in the West UP. Still, you know, super rare, but they have been able to document them over several years. So neat thing that, that came up recently that is uh, was pretty fun to dig into. All right, Cody. So uh, just to reiterate, uh, where can people find the updated management plan and any other bear information? Yeah, once the once the management plan is, is finalized into where most of our other bear information is, they can find that at michigan.gov slash bear. Well, thanks for joining us today, Cody. We really appreciate your time. Next up, we'll be answering questions from the mailbag, so you'll want to stick around. Did you know that you can take your hunting and fishing regulations with you wherever you go? Have access to the information you need when you need it right on your smartphone. Just visit michigan.gov slash DNR Digest to download the applicable hunting digest before you head out to the woods or the Michigan Fishing Guide before you hit the water. Download the most up-to-date regulations available today at michigan.gov slash DNR Digests. Welcome back to Wild Talk. Now let's dig into the mailbag and answer some of your questions. <laughs> question comes in from Lindsay. Hannah, what does Lindsay have to ask us today? Yeah, Lindsay called looking for resources for someone who is interested in learning how to hunt. So a new hunter uh, in her family looking for some resources for them to get started. Now, even though hunting seasons are winding down right now, it isn't too early to think about preparing for next season, especially if you're a new hunter. Um, now, a hunter safety course is a great place to start, and you can learn more about the different course options and sign up for one by visiting michigan.gov slash hunter safety. We also have a page on our website dedicated to learn to hunt resources and tools for getting started, and you can find that by visiting michigan.gov forward slash hunting. You know, and certainly after going through all those uh, resources and information, if you still have questions, let us know. We're happy to help. Mm -hmm. How about you, Rachel? Did you have any questions in our mailbag today? I did. So Kevin wrote in to us um, and was asking if there's any rules or regulations for elk shed hunting on public land. 
Uh, he was wondering if it's legal to hunt for and keep elk sheds. It is legal to keep antler sheds found on public lands. There is no permit needed. Only parts of the game animal that are shed naturally can be collected. However, if the antler sheds are attached to a skull or if you find uh, other skulls or carcasses of other game species, you must have a kill tag for that species and it must be during the open season for that animal for you to collect them. This time of year as the snow melts, uh, lots of folks will go out looking for deer sheds or elk sheds. Um, and if you just happen to find an antler that was shed naturally on the ground, you can collect it. No permit is needed. And if you're looking for locations to do that in, the elk herd is primarily across the Pigeon River Country State Forest. And so there's lots of public land up there for you to go look for sheds or view wildlife. There's a lot of great things to do up there in the spring. So we would recommend checking that location out. Now, as we zip this segment to a close, remember, if you have questions about wildlife or hunting, you can call 517-284-WILD or email us at dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov. Your question could be featured on the mailbag. Now is your opportunity to win a Wild Talk podcast mug. As a thank you to our listeners, we'll be giving a mug or two away every episode. Our February mug winners are Mike Zasik and Kevin Lefebvre. Check your email as we'll be getting in touch with you soon. Now they answered the question, what is a group of owls called? And that answer is a parliament. What a hoot. Ba-dum-tsh. To be entered into the drawing for this month, test your wildlife knowledge and answer our wildlife quiz question. This month's question is, what is the area inside a bear's nose called that allows them to smell 100 times better than humans can? All right. Well, if you think you know the answer, email your name and the answer to us at dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov to be entered for a chance to win a mug. Be sure to include the subject line as mug me and submit your answer by March 15th. We'll announce winners and the answer on next month's podcast. So be sure to listen in and see if you've won and so you can find out what our next quiz question will be. Best of luck. Now back to the show. It's finally getting closer, folks. Spring will be here soon, and with the warmer weather comes an abundance of wildlife activity. No doubt our listeners have heard us talk many times about baby wildlife and breeding seasons, not to mention just in this episode when we were talking about fox squirrels and having babies right now. So we wanted to kind of wrap up this episode uh, by sharing a few reminders before spring is in full swing. Probably heard us say these things before, but it always is worth repeating just to keep it fresh in your mind as we're approaching the new spring season. So in the coming months, as spring sets on, you can expect to see baby animals, nests, and eggs, probably really close to your home. And while it's really exciting to see, please remember to keep your distance and to give wildlife plenty of space to raise their young. Now, these adults of some species can be protective of their babies or nests, and other species use the strategy of leaving their young hidden and unattended to reduce the chances of being found by predators. For example, don't be surprised if you find a nest of bunnies, but don't see the mother around because she'll leave them kind of hidden off on their own and go elsewhere so as not to attract the attention of a predator. Um, And then she'll come back when the coast is clear to nurse those babies. The same was true for fawns, right? You could just find a fawn alone in maybe not even a a place you would expect to find a fawn. It can happen in, geez, garden beds, garden beds or porches or things like that. Backyards. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we won't see fawns for a while yet. That'll be more in May and June. Birds nests can also end up in some unexpected places. Uh, You might find songbirds nesting in your hanging flower pot on your porch or even a duck's nest in your garden bed. If you find them, you'll want to make sure to give them plenty of space and they will move on once they have hatched and left the nest. Yeah, and some animals you can discourage from nesting or creating a den by causing a lot of disturbance and using hazing techniques to scare them before they get comfortable. Most wild parents aren't going to want to raise babies where there's a lot of human activity 
and noise. Um, and so those kinds of things can help deter parents from setting up a home base too close to your house or in a place that you might not want them. And then, of course, in addition to seeing babies, uh, some of our hibernators will be waking up as the weather warms. Black bears in particular will be leaving their dens in the coming weeks and will be looking for food. And while they'll typically dine on lush, green spring vegetation, they will not pass up on the easy food sources, which typically includes bird seed. If you live in bear territory, so if in the Upper Peninsula or in Northern Lower Peninsula, right now is the time to take down your bird feeders so that hungry bears don't hang around your yard looking for free handouts. And you'll also want to make sure to keep your trash secure and not leave pet foods outside where the wildlife can get to it. Well, this wraps up our March episode. So thanks for joining us and tuning in. We'll see you right back here in April. This has been the Wild Talk Podcast, your monthly podcast airing the first of each month and offering insights into the world of wildlife across the state of Michigan. You can reach the Wildlife Division at 517-284-9453 or dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov.